Wow, nice haul. Told ya, Macy's Backstage has perfect last minute gifts. With prices so low, you never need a coupon. I scored the perfect makeup palette. Super cute. I grabbed these cool drones for the guys. Nice. Here's a handbag for Aunt Helen. Found awesome toys for the kids. Cookware for the budding chef. Oh, and look what I got for Uncle Hank. A puppy chew toy? No, no, that's for Rex. They even have gifts for pets. Well, you know Uncle Hank. He'd love anything <laughs> we gave him. Macy's Backstage. Savings for everyday life. Details at Macy'sBackstage.com. Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Nonprofit U, a forum where nonprofit stakeholders can share lessons learned and discuss the latest developments in the industry. My name is Valerie Leonard, your host. I'm a consultant to nonprofits and I specialize in community and organizational development. I work with nonprofit organizations to help them make a stronger impact to their clients and communities. You can find Nonprofit U on Facebook and Twitter, and I encourage you to follow us and to comment early and often using the hashtags Nonprofit U, Monroe Foundation, or Capacity Building. You can also leave comments on blogtalkradio.com forward slash nonprofit underscore U. The chat room is open, and you can post comments and questions. In order to use the chat room, you must open a listener-only account, and you can find a link to open the account on the page for this episode. You can also email me questions at consulting at ValerieFLeonard.com. We'll be taking questions by phone and from our chat room at about the 30-minute mark or so. Call-in number is area code 347-884-8121. Again, that number is 347-884-8121, and we will be taking calls at about the half-hour mark. Today's topic is organizational capacity building on the ground. We'll talk about the Monroe Foundation's lessons learned working with African-American-led organizations to build capacity, as well as their call for organizations to engage in the Chicago Community Trust on-the-table conversations. We have extended our podcast to one hour, and we encourage you to call in with questions again at the 30-minute mark. You can start posting in the chat room and emailing your questions right now, and if you don't have any, think of some as we go along. However, if you want to participate in the chat, you must open an account, and the link to open the account is found on this episode page, and, you know, you can also email me at consulting at ValerieFLeonard.com. Again, the call-in number is 347-884-8121. We're especially encouraging nonprofit and community development professionals to call in, share your stories, share your strategies, and even if you're just starting out, you know, there's no question that is too simple for us to answer. You know, the reason that we're having this call in the first place is always to share lessons learned, and I find that everybody can learn something on these shows regardless of how much experience they have. Today's guest is Otis Chandler Monroe III, Otis is the founder and CEO of the Monroe Foundation, which is a 27-year-old community reinvestment and economic justice and advocacy organization. And they have over 100 nonprofit and faith-based organizations throughout the Chicagoland area that are members. Since 1991, the foundation has successfully facilitated over $5 million dollars in CRA investments, and when we say CRA, that's the Community Reinvestment Act, which requires that banks reinvest their money into the communities from which they um, draw deposits, including the low-income communities. And they've also um, facilitated lending and other investments benefiting African-American communities and they have facilitated the redistribution of over $1 million in community development grants to grassroots community-based partners of the affiliate affiliate groups of the PAC project, and PAC stands for Partnership Assisting Community Transformation. Recently, the Monroe Foundation launched 
impacting power youth biz to provide entrepreneurship opportunities for youth and young adults between the ages of 16 and 24 in Chicago's Inglewood community. Mr. Monroe, in his advisory role to the Chicago Community Trust on the Table Initiative, has committed to recruiting 20 organizations to host discussions over meals to explore ways to make Chicago community stronger. Otis Monroe is a 1991 graduate of the Roosevelt University Graduate Fellowship in Nonprofit Management. So without further ado, I want to thank Otis for joining us today. But before we get started, Otis, can you give us a brief overview of the Monroe Foundation and how you got started in this work? Well, good afternoon, uh, Valerie, and to your listening audience. Um, uh, again, my, I am Otis Monroe. I'm president and founder of the Monroe Foundation. We are in our 27th year of social and economic justice advocacy. And uh, the Monroe Foundation started actually on my birthday in 1991. I had spent almost 20 plus years working in a not for profit community, if you will, as a community organizer, as a project manager, as an advocate on social justice and economic justice issues. And I felt that it was time to start an organization that, one, engage philanthropy in Chicago to be more accountable and open to new ideas, new thoughts, and new strategies mm -hmm. and approaches to supporting the initiatives that were coming out of uh, the base community. And when I say the base community, uh, communities that have indigenous stakeholders or residents or individuals who are indigenous to those communities, Inglewood, Roseland, the Austin community, Woodlawn, South Shore, that will engage in issues of economic rights, economic justice, social change, and their work was not being funded. And part of why they weren't being funded, one, philanthropy did not know about the work that these indigenous leaders were doing in their respective communities, and two, uh, a lot of those indigenous leaders did not have capacity to begin a dialogue or to approach philanthropy in Chicago at the time to initiate a dialogue around the potential investing or funding in the work that they were doing. And we felt that the mm -hmm. Monroe Foundation could be that vehicle of both advocacy and capacity building and positioning. Okay, awesome, awesome. Before we go deeper, can we talk a little bit about capacity building and, you know, we just want to make sure that we're all on the same page, you know, because different people mean different things when they talk about capacity building, and then capacity building might be a new term to others of us. So how does the Monroe Foundation specifically define capacity building, and can you tell us why it's so important? Sure. Well, the Monroe Foundation, as you mentioned, the Monroe the capacity building means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Uh, it may mean to some the ability to be fully functional and capable and able to pursue funding opportunities at any level, public sector, private sector opportunities. And because they have the capacity to do so, because they have the infrastructure, as we call it, they have the staffing place, they have a development team or development officer who is solely dedicated to the pursuit of funding opportunities or cultivating a donor base, and that's very legitimate. But for most of the not-for-profits that uh, the Monroe Foundation has historically worked with are those small and often emerging not-for-profits, uh, many under $100,000 in annual revenue um, that do not have capacity in place to be positioned at the ready to pursue mm -hmm. uh, funding opportunities. But I want to break it down to almost street talk uh, to mm -hmm. your listening audience. And that yeah. is, that is in, particularly in the African-American community, uh, most recently we played a role with the Chicago Community Trust in con convening uh, dialogue around the Safe Communities Rapid Response Grant Initiative. I want to use that as an example. And we held a mm -hmm. EA session 
uh, two weeks ago in the Inglewood community, in the Cats community room. And there were maybe 60-plus groups there who were interested in applying. Mm -hmm. Now, last year Mm -hmm. when Philanthropy in Chicago launched this initiative, it was a simple, streamlined application process. This year, Mm -hmm. and the the Chicago Community Trust and its partners in philanthropy that have seeded almost $800,000 to create the Safe Communities Initiative created a online grant portal. So moved away wow. from the paper application to you have to log, create a profile on Grant Central and then upload, respond to some very base questions. So it was a very streamlined and simple process. But my point to this here that on the back end, we began to get calls from numerous organizations that's working in the base community on issues of anti-violence and programming and projects and activities to keep youth and young adults and their communities uh, safe and through the engagement of activities. But there were many mm-hmm. groups, principally African-American based grassroots community groups that were having challenges in applying for these funds because they could not embrace the online technology. So to the Monroe Foundation perspective, that becomes a capacity issue because you may be doing excellent work in the area of anti-violence intervention and prevention, but you will be challenged in how we can get you funded or advocate for you to be funded that if we bring you in the room to the opportunity and then two things happen, you're not able to articulate the work that you're doing, which is critically important, critically important. Right. And I'm not right. meaning articulate in the sense that you have big and overly erudite words, overly educated words, just at base be able to talk about the work that you're doing. What's the impact that you're making and why this and why mm-hmm. someone's best in the work? but thou, you're not able to embrace the technology. And as you and I know, Valerie, that many grant opportunities can only be accessed through the use and the effective use of technology. And many in the African-American-based community have been challenged in embracing the technology. And what Mm -hmm. happened is that many groups that were doing fine work uh, waited till the last minute, so because of the issue of capacity to understand how to position yourself within a time frame to even be able to apply before the deadline, were trying mm-hmm. to apply at six, seven, eight o'clock, trying to meet the eleven fifty nine uh, 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 p.m. deadline before twelve midnight to apply. So capacity building for the Monroe Foundation is about being legitimately able mm-hmm. to legitimately take advantage of the opportunity by having the capacity to at base embrace or be willing to become trained so that you can embrace the standards and the norms in the not-for-profit community that is expected Mm -hmm. of you. Okay, so what I'm hearing from you, okay, yeah, so what I'm hearing from you is capacity building for you is, more than just a process, you know, because as a consultant, I, I think of different processes, right? Yeah. I think of stuff like strategic planning, putting financial systems in place, blah, blah, blah. But to hear you talk, it's more than that. It's, it's not just doing the work. It's a whole culture shift in, in the way yeah. that we do things. Because your work is very, your work is part of capacity building, but there's, there's, there's processes along the way. So if, if we have to spend time just building the capacity of volunteer individuals who have compassion for people and compassion uh, to to change the condition in their community, then before we can hand them off to you, if you will, as a non-for-profit consultant, as we have done from time to time, we have to make sure that to make sure that you're you're able to effectively do the the excellent work that you do in helping them guide them through a strategic planning process and put a document together that gives that can serve as a blueprint not only for themselves as to how they see impacting their mission impacting change in their community or or an issue within three to five years, 
we have to make sure they're able to just be able to understand and facilitate just the base process things like being able to mm-hmm. log into Grant Central, create a create a password and an account so that now uh from a funder's perspective, you're legitimately able to get grant information alerts and if you find a grant opportunity that matches your mission mm-hmm. and the legitimate work that you can legitimately do, do and you will take note, Valerie, and your listening audience. I'm using the word legitimately able to do, not trying to find a way to fit your program or your project into a funding opportunity that may sound like it's something that you do. Because, again, another part of base capacity building is understanding that most grant reviewers have a fairly understanding of the landscape in the Chicago land community as to who's doing what or what is really a legitimate program that someone is asking for funding for. So before mm-hmm. we bring them to you, we need to base, make sure that at base, even if you put a strategic plan together that they want to use as a tool towards putting the proposal together, for funding, we have to make sure they're able to embrace the standards and the norms just to be legitimately in the game mm-hmm. because it is not sufficient and it's not legitimate to say, I really don't understand. Why can't I just send you a paper proposal like I did last year? You don't get to challenge the process that's defining <laughs> how we want to invest in you potentially you have to have the ability to participate in the standards and the norms that the prospect is asking you to uh, engage in order for them to verify your legitimacy. Mm-hmm. Because that, and your, yeah. your inability, your in, one, the, the inability to embrace the standards and the norms also serves as a clue as to whether you have even capacity to mo- mobilize or engage the project or the program you're seeking funding for. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I really appreciate your going through that discussion because I, I know it took me years before I could really understand what capacity building was. I, I can remember as a new ED working with grassroots organizations back in 2000. People were talking about capacity building. I'm like, what is that? And and the mm-hmm. folks in the ivory tower would describe it as efficacy. I'm like, efficacy, what is that? Let me go look, you know, make it sound like we got, like we had some kind of disease or something, you know, because when I hear mm-hmm. efficacy, I think about drugs and, and how effective <laughs> those are. But, you know, those were not tangible words for me, you know, as a person doing this work in North Lawndale, and I really do appreciate the fact that you broke it down, you made it plain and simple. Well, again, it it becomes part of standards and norms, not only being able to access the, again, the the processes to even apply for funding or to be listed in the portal of, of, of philanthropy to get the grant alerts, but just understanding understanding the language. This Mm -hmm. work that we do, Valerie, and those that want to be credible in this work has its own language. And we have to be able to fundamentally understand that, that prospecting and gaining the interest of funders has a language of its own that we have to be able at times use as, again, part of our individual capacity to be legitimate before these funders. Mm -hmm. We have to embrace the standards and the norms, minimally so, at least at the beginning, so that we show some evidence of professionalism and legitimacy. We can still be snaggertooth and and (laughs) not necessarily have subject and verb agreement. And... If that's not who you are, then another part of capacity building is 
if I'm not the person to put together the strategy to present to the funder, I'm the person, founder of the organization that, and my job is that I have a heart full of compassion for people, and all I can do is speak to that compassion that I have for people, that I have for change in my community, then I am the opener to the to the prospect. But I have someone in my team or my board of directors or someone that's working with me that helps close the deal because that's the person that can put the language together using the mm-hmm. buzzwords, using the terminology, using the phrasing that and that that a prospective funder looks for in evaluating should we really consider funding or investing mm-hmm. in this initiative. And that is a conversation that we have very, very often, particularly with founder founding executive directors of of emerging not for profit organizations, many under three three years of age, they're the founding executive director. They they are the founder, but they're executive director only because they believe we're supposed to call ourselves an executive director. But then there's no there's not the skill set of capacity to function in the way that title demands. Mm-hmm. And the Monroe Foundation, from time to time through the years, have held half-day workshops, what we call uh, uh, first-time executive director workshop. What is an executive director? What is a chief executive officer? Because these titles mean nothing, Valerie, and to your listening audience, if you don't have the principal competencies of capacity to be legitimate in that title. What is being legitimate in that title? So if a prospect asks you how do you evaluate your 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 programs and how do you measure the effectiveness of the work that you do and you can't answer that for something we're working on then you're you're illegitimate in the use of that title and we mm-hmm. want black people particularly black people who are trying to build solutions to the many issues the many problems that plague our community in particular Mm-hmm. We want to make sure that they are legitimate in their approach. And legitimate in their approach is not saying that they themselves are not legitimate. They are very much legitimate, often, in their compassion. I will admit, I will admit, you know me a long time now. There's some folks that are just doing this work because they heard they can get some funding out there. And you were at a meeting that we held about two Saturdays ago in Inglewood, and a few folks asked about a $10,000 rapid response grant and how they could take $9,000 to pay themselves a salary. That's illegitimate. <laughs> that, those are signals right there. You're not trying to make right. change. You're trying to find a way to have some pocket money for the summer. Uh, <laughs> that's how I characterize it sometimes. But being legitimate in that title is being able to legitimately speak to how an organization will take $10,000 from a Safe Summer Initiative and in a one little pocket of the world, that they reside mm-hmm. in and that can begin to make some change. Mm-hmm. That's also and change that they can. Yeah, change they can document. So, change that they can document. Absolutely. I mean, the last last year, Labor Day weekend, when the Safe Summer Initiative or uh, Safe Communities Initiative was launched. One of the things we asked groups, particularly those that we served as a fiscal agent for, and we did it again this year because we're fiscal agent for about. 15 or so um, nonprofits that didn't have a, a 501c3, and that's fine. Some of them are still in mm-hmm. an incubating stage. But we suggested however much they get, put aside a couple hundred dollars to go beyond the reporting requirements of what you've done with the funding, if you're successful in your funding request, but put aside a couple hundred dollars just to put together a mini report 
or some evaluative mm-hmm. report. Use it as an opportunity to begin to build an ongoing relationship to philanthropy in Chicago by going beyond the minimal that the funder is asking for, that you will be asked to repair a report at the end of the term, at the end of October. It's going to probably be here. That's word again, an online report that you have to submit to. You should do that. But go be, think beyond mm-hmm. just the online reporting submittal. We're going to pr- send a report that just doesn't have a, a bunch of pictures in there and nice, you know, graphics. But this is how we evaluate. This is how many people were in the program. This is at the beginning. This is how many people were impacted at the end of the program. And this is how their lives were changed in some way, mm-hmm. in some way. This is how many people at the end of the program enrolled in GED or got and on the, and, and, or enrolled in uh, 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 um, a methadone treatment. Um, mm-hmm. So now they're less, they're, less, they're less apt to stand on the corner panhandling or thinking about crime because of the result of some activity that you had them engaged in that also connected them to counseling services or addiction services that they need. So that's 5, 10, 15 people that's less apt to commit a crime, that's keeping a community safe because they're in a program, they're in a, a housing program or that, that keeps them involved, keeps them treated, mm-hmm. keeps them talking. That's what these initiatives have to be about. It's not okay. just about awesome. giving folks a hot dog and, then, and my capacity is to buy, to have a nice event, and then the people go back and they still got that itch on them. How are you impacting yeah. change the issue that you say you're working on? And that brings me to another question. I know that you guys provide technical assistance in a number of areas. You know, this could be through small grants. It could be helping businesses, helping folks start organizations and all that good stuff. So can you share an overview of your technical assistance programs, and can you give us your approach that that makes you unique? Well, here's the interesting thing. Now, you know, in the early days of the Monroe Foundation, we focused on providing technical assistance to emerging not-for-profits, well, two categories of groups. One, to emerging not-for-profit organizations that were in the very beginning stages, wanted to establish a not-for-profit and eventually apply for a tax-exempt status with the IRS. And we would put mm-hmm. a strong premium on building capacity first, just making sure, because I'm of the opinion that the world ain't hurting for another not-for-profit that ain't going to do anything <laughs> with their exempt status. You may recall right. about five years ago that the IRS revoked thousands, nationally revoked thousands of tax exempt organizations that uh, when the Congress issued a rule two years before that not-for-profits that had not filed uh, 990s for three consecutive years, I believe, that uh, they right. were they were the, the, the exempt status were revoked, and the R the IRS did not make it easy to uh, 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 reverse these revocations. So I'm of the opinion that the world is not hurting for another not for profit that's not going to do anything. Well, we didn't do anything because we never got any grants, and then you you didn't need to do it. You didn't need to start this not for profit to begin with. So we right. put a lot. We put a heavy premium on board training and making sure there was buy-in from the board of directors or the forming mm-hmm. or the organizing board and take them through board training. And the, mm-hmm. and the last, really, uh, Valerie, in the last five years, we've really begun to do, we really moved away from that. And my position is if I'm not referring them to you for consult, I'm sending them to the law project. We, as a not-for-profit should, or any for-profit or, or not-for-profit, you know, we regularly, every few years, evaluate our effectiveness, evaluate our models, and try to keep ourselves competitive in such a way that we are, we have an attraction to our market of not-for-profit leaders and the organizations they're starting or are leading. So we kind of evolved a bit from a lot of the startup not-for-profits and really mm-hmm. focus on 
building or strengthening the capacity of more existing but still in an emergent stage of not-for-profit organizations that are already engaged in some aspect of committed and uh, reputable and work that is undeniably uh, making gradual impact. So our consult mm-hmm. becomes how to connect them to funding. That's really where we are right okay. now. How to connect those not for profits to funders. So we have relatively good relationships with the philanthropy and corporate philanthropy in Chicago. So our role mm-hmm. as a membership organization is that as we host our quarterly dialogues with um, funders, we call meeting with a Chicago grant maker. We hold readiness sessions to prepare those our members that may have programs or initiatives that mirror or align with the funding priorities of that potential supporter. We spend mm-hmm. time readiness sessions going through their the mission of that funder, that prospect, the application process, and how to best position the work of that organization. So in short, we've moved away from a lot of the startup not-for-profit work and really began Mm -hmm. to focus on working with not-for-profits maybe anyway under under five years old that are already fully Mm -hmm. engaged in some aspect of the work and really need to expand and diversify their funding base. That really has become Mm -hmm. the thrust of our mission. Okay, awesome. All right, I want to remind our listening audience that you're listening to Nonprofit You, and we're speaking with Otis Monroe. He's the president and CEO of the Monroe Foundation, and we are talking about organizational capacity building on the ground. We've extended our podcast to an hour, and we're taking questions right now, not only from the telephone, but from the chat room. So I'm going to speak calling on you and, you know, let me know if you have a question listening. And um, if you don't have any questions, we will continue our conversation. So the first caller that I'm going to ask whether or not he has a question is from area code 773-307-8096. Caller, did you have a question? Okay, I take it that there was no question here. And I'm going to try a second caller, area code 773-624-0585. Okay, caller, did you have a question? Hi, good afternoon. Valerie and Otis, how are you both? This is oh, a great well, thanks. Hi, Hi yeah. this is David Pendleton from Dark Hope Rescue Mission. How are you both? Very great. well, thank you, you, sir. Good, good. I, I noticed I met you some years ago through Frank Gauss. And, uh, of course, that way I know you. And I'm, mm-hmm. it's been a very, very interesting, very straightforward uh, lesson uh, in this time that you guys have been on. And I hope that there are people that are listening because these are things that uh, I found helpful. What I did know that you've spoken on is things I did not know. I'm definitely taking notes, especially when you spoke okay. about the legitimacy of the executive director. Um, and I found, and I, and I agree so much that the evaluation is the true barometer. But I also found that you know, your evaluation is reflected in the ever-changing narrative of the organization uh, and being able to articulate that in those uh, numbers for people to understand your needs. Mm-hmm. Where I have a question is where the board chair and executive director have, a, a, in my opinion, a mutual accountability for the legitimacy of that the organization as well as the role of that executive director. That is something I feel that board needs to understand uh, when that person is hired. Um, yeah. you know, a lot of these places are not founded by the ED. They're, they're founded by an organization, <laughs> and that role has several people that take that, that role. And, and, you know, with greed being uh, the motive of some, the board should be the stopgap of that ever even happening in, in the uh, narrative of a grant or any other funding opportunities. So I'm, I'm asking, you know, 
at what point is the board also accountable for the legitimacy of that executive director's actions and uh, evaluation? Well, I'd like you to take this, uh, if you don't mind, because you, you, you've you been working more with boards than I have of recent. Mm-hmm. Do you want to take a stab at that? Sure, sure. Uh, legally, the buck stops with the board. The The board is culpable legally for all the actions of an organization, even more so than the executive director. The executive director is an employee. Um, God forbid if there's any malfeasance, you know, amongst any employee or board member, you know, it's the board that the IRS is going to go to first. Now, having said that, that does not mean that the executive director gets away, you know, scot-free. You know, the executive director is there to implement the vision for the board. Um, The board is there to set strategic direction. They're there to oversee policy They should not be in the business of sticking their fingers in the day-to-day operations. You know, you wouldn't, you know, what's the point in having staff? But when you have a small staff, you know, you're necessarily going to have to have a working board. So in early stages, when you form your organization, and I agree with you, you know, you, you tend to start with an organization that may not necessarily have staff, and once you hire the staff, it gets very difficult for people who founded the organization, who had their hands in everything, to relinquish some of the control. So in the early stages, you really need to be clear to delineate the roles of the board and the staff, but at the same time, there needs to be an expectation that this is a working board. There's no one person that can do everything for an organization and make it successful. So it needs to be some clarity around, you know, what hands-on types of things your working board is going to do, but do it in such a way that they're not in in a, you know, conflict situation with the executive director or any other staff. So there needs to be clarity around those roles, responsibilities, and those duties. But legally, the, the board is ultimately responsible. I don't know if that answered your question. Did, did it answer your question, or do I need to be more specific? I, I think it gives a nice um, outline, uh, but I mm-hmm. thought that Otis had some very good points on legitimacy. I, I think he used that word quite a few times, and if somebody <laughs> didn't hear it, they just don't want to be legitimate. <laughs> and, 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 yeah. I don't want to, <laughs> I, you know, I don't, I don't want to take the, uh, uh, the onus off of the ED, but I just thought that the, the full scope of work of the organization should show uh, both sides. But I think uh, mm-hmm. not as you said, but you said, I think it even adds even more uh, impact to evaluation, which uh, I think would, you know, if or either if you have something to say on the actual evaluation, uh, because that's what he said made the ED legitimate. And I, I think that's a pretty powerful statement. And, uh, one of the things that we found from time to time, from our perspective, is you have a you have a person in a community who, again, has a a passion for making a difference and is compassionate about helping people um, do the best for themselves or see a better a better way of life. Improving the quality of life, the buzzword often used. And mm-hmm. they form a not for profit organization and then they begin to get some 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 att- some attraction because they're actually making a difference. Now they start to get some funding with that attraction. Now they want to now they want to go from being the founding president of the organization to founding president and executive director. But they're <laughs> they're, they're illegitimate in that role because they don't have the competencies or the core skill to function in that executive director. So the challenge becomes from the Monroe Foundation is to convince them this is not what you do. You need to remain the president, if you will, should the board should the board want you to be now, uh, because <laughs> the challenge, too, is that many, not prop, many founding 
leaders of not-for-profits fail to understand or challenge to understand or outright don't want to understand that the not-for-profit does not off the the structuring does not operate as if a for-profit would operate where you can be president for life you cannot be removed and so uh so therefore and even in that role because you may be the founding president but the board may want to remove you at some point because you're not even functioning legitimately in that role mm-hmm. Sometimes we may be the one that some of the best not-for-profit examples are those that were founded by an individual because they wanted to see something different happen in their community or happen in the world. And, but, and they played a role in building the infrastructure of the organization, meaning building uh, – uh, a, a leadership structure of board, of board members who are committed to building a strong organization that can attract support towards that would help it grow and have sustainability. Not board members who everybody on the board care about the community, but I really need a job. Now when the money's come, well, how can I get one of those jobs? Why I can't get paid now for taking a minute? So the best examples of not-for-profit leadership have been those where the founder founded the organization, incubated it to a point of stability or at least the legging towards stability, and then removed Mm -hmm. themselves, removed themselves, maybe not even taken or maybe not even took a leadership role, just wanted to remain uh, a stakeholder in the community process. So evaluating these processes often too begins with evaluating one's own capability. To I'm, I was I was good at being a part of the founding of the organization, but trying to build infrastructure that attracts support, that sustains support. That's not what I do. I am at the end of the day. I'm an agitator in the community on this issue, and, that, and therefore I'm going to just be a member of the organization as an agitator. I'm not going to be part of the leadership. I was just part of the formation of the organization. So there's so many different legs to this whole process of building and sustaining and keeping your not-for-profit relevant even. I mean, the Monroe mm-hmm. Foundation, even in 27 years, we have to, year after year, we have, at the end of the year, we have a kumbaya, get together with some tea and some <laughs> cocoa in December. And let's revisit what we did the previous 12 months and what we need to look at the following year just to keep our, our current funders' interest as well as attract new support. So, uh, for an example, one of the programs we ran for many years was what we call the Small Business Boot Camp, you may recall Valor. And we ran that program right. between Kennedy King College and for three years at Malcolm X College in the Austin community where we focus on each year we try to find a different way to support the launch of business enterprise. And each year we had challenges for getting people to move in that direction although there were folks that said they wanted to start a business. We even had grant money to help them. We just never realized the kind of outcome that I, the board was was satisfied with. Mm-hmm. And so we had to evaluate what do we do differently the following year. Well, we switched the model. So this year we're not running the program, the, our leadership said. We're not going to run the program. We're not going to run 12 weeks at the city college anymore. We're going to go back and revisit some of those that went through the program that did start a business and find out what their gaps are in their growth and let's invest in their growth. So now by doing that, um, we repositioned repositioned ourselves through, but we had leadership who understood it's not always about having a program running in the community just to say we're running a program in Inglewood 
when folks are mm-hmm. not, we're not realizing the game that we had hoped, but leadership that says, well, I want to be able to say this because I live in Inglewood and we should be doing this in Inglewood. You and just get the people the information. No, leadership is about being able to say, perhaps this is not working, perhaps we need to change this and try a different way mm-hmm. in order to keep ourselves, to keep ourselves relevant. Okay, that that's an excellent response. David, did that answer your question? Or Absolutely. Still some... Thank you. Okay. No, 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 no. Right. That was perfect. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much for calling in and, and asking. Thank you. Um, we're going to... We're going to open it up to other callers, other folks in the chat room. If you have any questions, um, please feel free to call in. The number is 347-884-8121. I tell you, I'm I'm really enjoying what I'm hearing, Otis. I always learn something, even though we know each other very well and talk, talk often. I always learn something, so I thank you. So at, well, at this point, you. I'll... <laughs> I, I want to ask you about lessons learned along the way. You know, some of the things you said made me think about, you know, lessons learned. Are there some things that you would do differently? Are there other things that you would reinforce um, as a result of, you know, the years and years of work that you've done on this issue on several sides of, of the equation? Yes, I guess. Lessons learned. Um, well, in the early days of the Monroe Foundation, I was challenged with the board to define who we should be in the marketplace mm-hmm. of the community. And what I mean by that, we knew that we wanted to, we knew that Fundamentally, we wanted to build the capacity of African American led not for profits to be able to leg- be legitimate in the work that they're doing, and with that legitimacy, legitimacy, able to make the ask. And what we call make the ask to your listening audience, making the ask, being able to ask for support, ask for funding. And in our early days, right. We used, to, we used to work very closely with the Chicago Community Trust even then and the MacArthur Foundation and the uh, uh, United Way of Chicago. And at that time, back in the early 90s, each of those foundations, particularly the United Way and the MacArthur Foundation, had these portal grant initiatives. Um, mm-hmm. uh, I forget the one that the United Way had, but the, the MacArthur Foundation, one of the largest foundations globally, had a program, an entry program is what I mean by portal, called the Fund for Neighborhood Initiatives. And what we Mm -hmm. had, uh, were able to get these foundations to become a part of was these readiness practice proposal sessions, whereas we would identify for my members maybe five or so member organizations that had projects that fit within the funding criteria and guidelines and interests of either of those funders, we mm-hmm. would work with them to develop a practice proposal and submit it to them, and then could reconvene maybe 90 days later where those program officers who make a recommendation to their board about funding would critique those proposals. And oh, that's great. That was very, no one else was doing that. No one else was doing that back in the 90s. And... In the early days of the Monroe Foundation, I had to decide, I as its president, with my board, do we stick really to what our founding principle was, was capacity building of African-American-led organizations to be legitimate in the ask, while also, mm-hmm. being, a, while also being an activist foundation. And what we determined is that we can be an activist foundation, but we can't do it in the same way that a community-based organization would do it. And Mm -hmm. uh, that's why I made it a point to go back to school and was a fellow in the original nonprofit management program before SPIRTUS and before North Park. Uh, Roosevelt University had the program that was led by Dr. Roberta Liebler and Aubrey Penny. 
a recently retired president of the Field Foundation of Illinois. Um, so lesson learned is that the first lesson learned is that be true to your mission. Mm. The mission of the Monroe Foundation is to educate, link, and fund community and economic development projects working within low and moderate income communities in the state of Illinois. So implement the mission by continuing to build the capacity of African American led not for profits to be able to effectively and legitimately engage in social and economic change. Mm-hmm. And do that by providing them the training and the tools and the counsel to do so. But I, the Monroe Foundation becomes ineffective in doing so if I take the activist stand. Oh, here's a very good point. Very recently, about a month ago, the city treasurer was going to hold a press conference downtown to announce that his office was implementing a municipal depository accountability for banks that do business with the city of Chicago. Now, fundamentally, Mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with that. However, many of our Monroe Foundation members that we have worked with and were successful in getting their work funded by banks, some of these Mm -hmm. banks that are city depositories, asked, should we go to this press conference? Now, Without a consult of a Monroe Foundation, I think many of them would have gone to the press conference, but I urge them not to, because if the press conference is about a policy to hold banks accountable, which is a good thing, and it's part of our advocacy as well, mm-hmm. but if my, some of my members, if my belief and opinion and consult is that if you went down to the press conference, you create the, the wrong optic, because you may it may give the appearance that you're also, you support the ordinance that hold banks accountable, but are you also suggesting that some of the banks that are municipal depository that you want to hold accountable are already some of the very same banks that are underwriting and supporting the work that you're doing in your specific community. And mm-hmm. part of capacity building is being able to navigate those political waters. Every press conference is not the press conference for you. (laughs) Every photo op is not the photo op for you because if the press conference is about holding banks accountable and some of those banks that's been funding your work and increasing each year's funding of your work, that you already have access to the very dialogue the elected official is talking about through him you'll have dialogue, but you already have it. That's not the optic for you. That's not the <laughs> press conference for you. There's no <laughs> war there. And But, again, that's part of capacity building, being able to judge these political waters, whether the whether they're, they're political waters that come from elected officials or inherent within the community. Every press conference, every rally, Every march, every protest may not be yours. And you have to be willing you have to be willing to make those decisions and make them quick. <laughs> and be willing to stand by it and 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 be able to uh take the heat, take the fire, often from your own community, sometimes within your own ranks. Yes, yes, yes. I, I know how that goes no, and I will I know you do. <laughs> You cannot declare war when there's you cannot declare war when there's no fight for you. Everybody's cause ain't your cause and everybody's cause may be your cause, but you may have a more defined and strategic approach to your role in that cause. Therefore for the Monroe Foundation, on our when you look at our Facebook page, you will not see me in the bathroom with a mirror and looking at myself grooming, look how I'm dressed today. You will only see the work that we're doing in the community to create opportunity for access. That's all you're going to see. My, my personal opinions, my personal comments are my personal opinions and my personal comments. 
stay focused on mission. Stay focused on mission. Stay focused on missing mission and messaging that mission. Okay, we have just a few minutes left, and I want to talk about on the table. You know, you're an advisor sure. to the Chicago Community Trust, and you are encouraging folks around the city to have these on-the-table discussions. So can you tell us a little bit about that initiative yes. and some of the uh, work that has come out of it? On the, on the Table is an annual convening. I believe it's in its third year. Uh, it's an annual convening that's led by the Chicago Community Trust within the Chicago region, you know, its funding area, to encourage citizens, everyday people, to come together, eight or more, around the table or, or, or at the kitchen sink, at the water cooler, uh, at the barbershop, wherever, to talk mm-hmm. about issues or an issue that they want to see impacted. And maybe they want to impact that issue themselves through some kind of way. And with that opportunity, they can produce a three-minute video called Acting Up that reports out to this is what we talked about at our on-the-table gathering, and this is what we're going to do about it, and upload a three-minute video, send it to the Chicago Community Trust, and you may have an opportunity to receive $1,000 or two or $2,500 or two, two, two $2,500, thank you, to implement that vision. But more important than the money, for those out there in the community that say, we don't know how to connect to the Chicago community trust. We don't know how to get our abortions heard by philanthropy. This becomes an opportunity to share mm-hmm. ideas and create connectivity. So we are pleased to be a partner with the Chicago Community Trust and encouraging groups and individuals to hold these convenings. Uh, you got one coming up. We're going to support your event. Um, and I encourage all your uh, listeners, for those listening, to go to Chicago Community Trust website at cct.org, uh, contact the Chicago Community Trust, and ask for uh, Maritza Bandera, Maritza the, the Bandera, the Civic Engagement Manager for the Chicago Community Trust. It's not too late to sign on, or just go to the website again, cct.org, type in the search engine on the table, it'll take you to the website where it's a portal where you can register to have a dialogue and report mm-hmm. back on that dialogue to the Chicago community. Church. So, again, th- these are opportunities they bring attention to your voice. The, the, the theme is your voice matters. But the only way your voice matters is that you legitimately embrace the opportunity to get your voice heard. I love it. I love it. We got to do this again soon. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's there's just so much. I mean, there's so many more questions that I have of you, and you know, your knowledge runs extremely deep. So you definitely got to come back and come back soon. Um, so we're winding down, and Otis, I want to give you an opportunity to give your closing statement. It's not like you're on trial; you're not litigating a case, but. What, what's your closing statement? How can folks get involved with the Monroe Foundation? And, and most importantly, as you talk about this work, what's your unique value proposition for joining the Monroe Foundation? So include all of that in your wrap-up. Well, you can always contact the Monroe Foundation at uh, 773-315-9720, 773 Nine seven two zero. Uh, that's the right to me. Uh, we are a membership-based organization, and the most unique value of our of membership with the Monroe Foundation, I think, that sets us apart from all others, is that we connect you directly to funding opportunities. Again, as I mentioned, we hold quarterly dialogues with uh, potential grant makers. We can never guarantee them funding, but we've had a pretty good track record. I think our advocacy resulted in over half a million dollars in uh, funding uh, to our, our member organizations last year. Oh, and the awesome. average grant size, anywhere, and thank you, and the average grant size is anywhere from $25,000 uh, to fifty to $100,000 in funding. So it depends on the type of organization and the work they do and the strength of their, the strength of their credibility 
and their legitimacy to actually substantiate that if we're asking for a hundred thousand dollars or two hundred fifty thousand dollars, this is how we can demonstrate our ability to administer the program with that kind of money. So uh, my parting thought would be the most important word throughout this whole hour is legitimacy, legitimacy, Mm -hmm. legitimacy, because certainly only those that are legitimately able to substantiate and prove their theory, prove their ability to do what they say they are doing or say that they want to do is only through their legitimacy of capacity to show they can do this work uh, are those that get attention. Okay, so on that note, I want to say thank you so much. We've come to the end of our show, and thank you so much, Otis Monroe. I just want to remind our listeners that Otis is the president and CEO of the Monroe Foundation. And, again, you can get in contact with him. What's your number again, Otis? 773-315-9720. And just a quick shout-out to all our supporters, uh, O.S. Owens with the uh, AARP, Paul LeBond, Tony Smith with PNC, Eva Brown, Melissa Barino with uh, U.S. Bank, and Robert McGee and George Wright with City Community Development, and Manny Jimenez and Sandy Turner with Marquette Bank, and Melinda Kelly with the Talent Business Association, and, and Athena Williams, too, our project coordinator. Uh, the work of the Monroe Foundation is only as effective as those who support us and those who uh, help me implement our mission. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you. Okay, and thank you. And I want to thank our listeners for listening to Nonprofit You Blog Radio Talk Show. I want to thank our callers for calling in. You didn't all have questions. I want to thank the folks in the chat room. And <coughs> thank you, David Pendleton, for sharing your questions, your thoughts. You added a lot to the conversation, and I really appreciate that. So and until then... Um, I want to um, thank you. So our next show will be Monday the 15th at 2 o'clock, and my guest is going to be Lamont Watts. Lamont is the program director for Future Vision Entertainment. Um, Some of you may know that I will be joining the, the global news forum. You know, I'm not going to abandon Block Talk Radio, but um, global um, Global News Forum will be where I do the live recordings and then I'll use Blog Talk Radio to syndicate the show. And this will give us a greater presence in five major U.S. markets and then it will also help us to continue to expand internationally. So I'm very, very excited about that. So um, we're going to be talking about what that new format looks like. And Otis, I really want to have you back. I'm there, you come so, Bless you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. All righty. So I'm going to sign off for now, and I look forward to hearing from everybody next week. All right. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. All right. Good day. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm. Get to Old Navy two days only, today and tomorrow. Wrap up Old Navy's PJ pants for adults for just five bucks. That's right, five bucks. Don't sleep on it. It ends tomorrow at Old Navy and OldNavy.com. Valid 1215 to 1216, select styles only.